our next esteemed speaker is Dr. Rajiv Agrawala. Dr. Rajiv Agrawala is Chairman, Department of Cardiology at the Jaswant Rai Hospital, Meerut. He has interest in preventive as well as invasive cardiology, particularly diabetic vascular disease. He has received several awards like the Amar Ujala National Award, Excellence Award for Lifetime Achievement, and several other awards. His department implants free pacemakers for needy people and holds the Limca Book of Records for implanting maximum number of pacemakers in India. Dr. Rajiv Agrawala is a very prolific speaker, and I request uh, Dr. Yolekar and Dr. M.C. Agrawal as chairpersons, Dr. Yolekar, to initiate that session. Dr. Yolekar, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manoria, for inviting me. And this is a very vital topic that we are going to discuss. The macro aspect has been discussed in the previous lectures. And now, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal has uh, shown an illustrious personality in this field. I request him to start his talk on LP Little Thank you, Dr. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a unique opportunity to be part of second cardiometabolic conclave under the leadership of Dr. Manoria. I am going to talk about LP little a, basic concepts and emerging therapies, which have become over a period of time a very important issue in secondary prevention. Before going to the topic as such, I always believe there are three foundation stones in management of atherosclerosis, especially in secondary prevention. The first of them is atherosclerosis never sleeps. That means clinician and the community alike both should be awake for lifetime intervention because atherosclerosis is a relentlessly progressive disease. The second concept is we are not artery cleaners. We are artery healers, meaning thereby we have to understand essentially the treatment of atherosclerosis is not mechanical, it is metabolic. The third slide, which you must have seen several times, speaks of something what we can do in secondary prevention. Several of these strategies have done wonderfully well, like lipid lowering, residual thrombotic risk, and residual diabetes risk. But there is an over-emerging need to improve ourselves in triglyceride management, inflammatory risk reduction, and today, the topic of discussion, LPA risk. The layout of the talk is the structure of metabolism and anthropology of LPA, mechanism and casualty of atherothrombosis, and our therapeutic dreams. This is one of the master slides, and I could not get better than this. What is LDL and what is LPA? LPA is nothing but LDL molecule where with sulfur bonds, the ApoA protein which is produced in the liver is attached. So these molecules are more or less similar except that you have an ApoA crown on LDL molecule which makes it different but pathologically they behave in the same direction. So this is a master slide you should carry in your mind. Another thing which is very common to misunderstand is what is apolipoprotein A1, A2, and this is LP little a. They are two different structurally protein. One is pathological and another is pro-health or anti-disease state. So they are not similar. They are found in two different particles. ApoA is on HDL and LP little a on, uh, uh, in lipoprotein A. This is another way to look at it. Just to bring you to the molecular uh, biology of this molecule, you have LDL, which has got ApoB, and you have oxidized phospholipids on it. It has got an inactive protease domain, and these are called kringles. They are like beads in the chain, and kringle four repetitions are the beads, uh, beads and these beads from 3 to 10 
they remain constant. What varies is Kindle for two repetitions. So you can have a patient or an individual or an, a primate where they may be four, another may be with 40. That is how they are different, make out the migration of human race depending upon these uh, Kringle repetitions. So what varies is Kringle two repetitions. This molecule looks like a plasminogen, but plasminogen when activated like by TPA, then they become fibrinolytic. But this molecule is pro-fibrinogen. That means it increases clotting. So they are they are look alike, but they are divergent in their actions. We'll elaborate on this point subsequently. This is Dr. Uh, Kerr Barg, who discovered this in 1963, the lipoprotein A, and you can make out the repetitions of LP little a with the result that there may be long chain in some individual, short chain in some individual. So there are 40 such isoforms of LPA. If you have bigger chain of lipoprotein A, body takes longer time. So the same amount, say 50 milligram of LPA, you will have less particle numbers. If you have a shorter chain, you will have more particle numbers, like something like small LDL where you have more APOP in the body. So similarly, if LPA levels are high, you have more APOP. On top of it, there is another crown, which is also pro-disease state. So you are double-edged sword if you talk of lipoprotein little a. I talked about oxidized phospholipid. is a unique feature to humans only. LPA is present in human apes and monkeys, but oxidized phospholipid, which is atherothrombotic, is only present in mammalians, or let me say, human race. Once again, getting back to the same molecular structure, so you really know where to uh, differentiate between LDN and LPA. When you calculate LDL, the calculated LDL have both these molecules, of course, VLDL is a bigger, so they are different class of agent. So, LPA, L lipoprotein little a, can masquerade the low density lipoprotein because they are more or less same in size and shape. This is a very, very important work of Dr. Simikas, which uh, has shown that a patient who has got so-called LDL-70, if having different level of LPA, we believe that one third of LPA is cholesterol. So this is LPA level, this is LPA-C, one third is cholesterol. So if you have 15 milligram of LDL, 15 milligram percent of LPA, you have 5 milligram of LPA-C. So you have to subtract from 70, this 5, and your real LDL is 65. On extreme of it, if you have 210 of LPA, practically you don't have any LDL. It is primarily LPA alone. So this is a very, very new concept that when you are talking of LDL, you have to take note of LPA-C and do an appropriate correction in LDL-C level. So once again, summarizing that when you calculate LDL-C, you calculate both ILD, uh, intermediate density cholesterol, actual LDL-C and LPA-C. When you directly measure, still you measure LPA. So that is a very big problem and it overestimates LDA if you do LDL, if you don't make a correction of LP. I have made this point pretty clear to you. This molecule is pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombogenic, pro-atherosclerotic uh, pro and pro-thrombogenic. So it has got wide variety of effects which leads to progression or beginning of atherosclerosis. The metabolism, since this is synthesized in liver and the clearance is very poor and there are multiple receptors for its clearance, the levels are decided by generation of the APOA and this is produced in the liver and there are multiple receptors which clear, there is no specific LPA clearance receptor. 
So there are various receptors, about five of them, which clear the LPA. Regarding the casualty that what is the cause-effect relationship between LPA and atherosclerosis, we have from Ingham data which showed that high LPA and high LDLC, they are the biggest risk factor for causing the disease and the risk decreases if both of them are low. Same way, in familial hypercholesteremia, if the LPA levels are high, you have higher risk, meaning thereby that LPA level magnifies the risk factor profile of the individual. Then we have recurrence of event, high tertile patient, that means tertile 3, they have a higher event rate and these patients will have higher poor outcome. Then we have casually mediated CVD where meta-analysis, Mendelian randomization and genomic wide association all show linear relationship with this molecule. As you have seen in LDL graphs, similarly, you have uh, witnessing the same kind of curve with LPA. If the level keeps increases more than 25, there is almost a linear relationship. A modified fibrin clot in severe aortic stenosis, as I told you, the molecule mimics like a plasminogen and has got opposite property than plasminogen. Even in OTC trial, we have shown, the workers have shown that the LPA lowering independently contributes to outcomes independent of LDL lowering. Another aspect which is very, very important talked about is coronary calcification and LPA. If LPA is high, the five quintile and calcium score is more, the risk is, less risk is maximum. And you can make out that higher quintiles are associated with higher calcification. And this is beautifully shown in aortic valve calcification. Aortic valve calcification linearly correlates with LP level, unlike mitral valve, which also show calcification, but it is pronounced in aortic valve, maybe because of higher pressure had. And 31% of aortic valve calcification is due to LPA. The same thing one can make out in Copenhagen general population study that higher the calcium, higher the percentile of LPA, higher is the uh, aortic valve calci uh, stenosis and calcification. So there is a strong correlation between LPA and calcification, which is more than LDL. Surprisingly, in venous thrombosis, LPA does not contribute in pathogenesis. It is only in arterial events. LPA is once in lifetime advice and can be used as an important tool in risk assessment, even in primary prevention. This is a very passionate thing and very close to my heart. Maybe many of you who are seeing it can download this article, it is free article, whether it is an ancestral benefit or a pathogen, I feel over a period of time we don't need active complement systems and prevention of bleeding, which was very important thing in early primitive life. As our life is changing, we have to shift from these two uh, inherited virtues now and our DNA has to unlearn these things. Recommendation is class 2AC and Indian guidelines which are just published about a week back show that the cutoff level high risk is 50 and the moderate risk is 20 to 50. And these are the situations where we need to do LPS. Alice in Wonderland is the therapeutics and I always feel it is a uh, fantasy, those who have witnessed cardiology, that how we are manipulating our genes to handle this problem. It is a risk factor, an emerging therapeutic target, like 20% risk reduction is 1 millimole of LDL. Similarly, you have to reduce 65.7 milligram of LDL to get those 20% risk reduction, more or less the same corollary. The another thing which is very, very important and just published is the benefits of LPA reduction with PCSK9 in patients 
who are nominally controlled in LDL. This is ODC data and what they have shown, if your LDL is less than 70 in ODC, the LPA reduction further reduces the risk. That means the effect of LPA reduction are achieved when your LDL is adequately achieved. If your LDL level is more than 70, then reduction in LPA does not translate into risk reduction. So LPA plays a very, very important role in risk reduction and secondary prevention, especially if you have achieved LDL level. Various drugs are there. The newer drugs like agitamide, bempedoic acid, low, uh, uh, they do not help in LPA reduction, but drugs like PCSK9, CTP inhibitors in glycerin, they reduced LPA. So there are a couple of drugs which work both on LDL and LPA. They are CTP inhibitor, PCSK9, and plasma apheresis. And we are developing now newer drugs which are specifically working on this. There are two technologies, ASO and silencing RNA. And we can have these three upcoming trials and drugs, Pelakarsan, Alpasiran, and Apollo trial, which is just published in ACC by Dr. Stephen Nitan. Pelkasaran shows those related reduction in LPA level. So we have phase two trial with Pelkasaran, and now we will go, we are enrolling phase three patients. This is a Polo trial, just in 32 patients showed that this molecule can also reduce LPA level. But this is a very first small, uh, first in man trial, just with 32 participants. It is the effect based trial. FRS something which can be done in very high risk patients who have high LPA level and aphoresis gradually reduces the LPA level and German studies have shown reduction in, in events after one year of aphoresis. This is something very close to my heart, once and done approach where you just use scissors to remove the gene. This has been tested in monkeys by Seth Carrison group and they have successfully shown one injection knocks off the PCSK9 gene permanently. And they are working, the same group is working on LPA also, but they have not yet published their data on this aspect of one time knockoff of gene seizure based gene removal. So this is a very good thing upcoming and it had been tested with uh, monk in primates and published in Lancet. So just to conclude, LPA is a very fascinating molecule to understand and lowering of LPA is possible. This is realistic without side effect and we are waiting for on the horizon a new dawn of era where this translates in suivi risk reduction. This is anybody who wants to learn about LPA should follow on Twitter Dr. Simikas who is a torch bearer in LPA understanding. He has advised some novel ideas to make people aware of LPA by making a national stamp, that is one thing, or offering LPA marks, because that is how you get closer to the concept. And I'll conclude with this, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of my patients showed a tattoo that how many stents are placed in his art, and when you work on these secondary prevention strategies, I am sure there will be no more stent in these patients. With these remarks, I think I have been able to put across my views on LPA. Their reduction is a reality, and we are very, very, we are very eagerly waiting for outcome data. Thank you very much. Yes of LPA. There was a time when the fortunes were shifting. There was a time when LPA was not considered a very important therapeutic target. Now you have brought out that concurrent reduction of LDL and LPA is possible through PCSK inhibitors. What have you to say on the degree of reduction of both with PCSK inhibitors? I'll say when you use PCSK9, it is predominantly LDL-driven therapy where you have about 25-30% LPA reduction 
as one of the minor effects. Now we are entering into era where we have specific therapies for LPA reduction. So maybe uh, some individual who have modest level of LPA, they may be taken care of by PCSK9 on their L L LPA front also. And there are people who have very high LPA. Maybe they need specific therapies to reduce LPA depending upon their risk profile and depending upon the data outcome. Now, literature does say that uh, statins are of no use, but uh, low-dose aspirin can be useful in LPA. What is your take on that? Uh, aspirin is known to reduce LPA. Niacin is known to reduce LPA. Statins, in fact, paradoxically increase LPA level, but somehow the final outcomes like glycemic status, although it worsens, but the outcome improves. Similarly, despite increase in LPA level following statin therapy, outcomes continues to be on a positive side. So that effects is to be treated like glycemic effects of uh, statins. Uh, Dr. Agrawal, what is the mechanism of increase in LPA by statins? Vitavastatin was not shown to increase LPA in the meta-analysis. So what, what is the mechanism? Uh, this is uh, induction of the gene by the statins because LPA levels are primarily genetics-based. Lifestyle and diet do not affect uh, the LPA level. So one of the mechanisms is either there is a poor clearance or more production, but bias is that statin probably induces the gene for LPA production and that increases the level. See, when we talk Good. of gene silencing, there are three modalities of treatment. One is the antisense, another is small interfering RNA, and third is aptomer. So for the sake of physician, could you clarify these three in a simplistic form, all these three strategies, the antisense therapy, the small interfering RNA, and the aptomer, because most of the physicians are not clear with the basic concepts of these. I'll, I'll uh, put forward the case taking into PCSK9 <coughs> model. That is very under, easily understandable. One is, so once you have PCSK9, which is an express protein in the blood, one way is to block it by antibodies. So you, you, you can have antibodies against it and you block it. The another way is a step before by silencing the gene. And the stage further is that even you remove the gene by CRISPR technology that has been shown by uh, Dr. Seth Karrison, and that is called CRISPR technology, that is called gene scissors. Further on. So what I'll say as a clinician, as a clinical lepidologist, we are not to be concerned about the methodology used. What we are need to understand is how it effectively works and what is the outcome data. Let biochemist and core uh, molecular biologist and genetist handle this issue because as clinician, there is no point learning these intricacies. I very strongly feel we are clinicians passing on the science to community. We are not in the business of genetics and creating these molecules.
insights from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com.